Hello everyone, welcome to the fourth episode of in Experience Matters in Engineer Learnings. And today we have with us a very special guest of honor, uh, Mr. Rajoshi Bondopadhyay. Uh, you know, he's uh, a principal engineer at uh, Alda Topso currently, and he has been associated with companies like IOCL and Linde in the past as well. So our uh, vivid experience of 15 years and someone I, I really look up to uh, when I uh, go for any consultation or uh, someone whom I closely follow because the interest that we possess about the refinery and this crude oil uh, distillation and things are quite common. So uh, kind of deriving the interest from there. So uh, none other than the industry expert with us today uh, to give us some guidance uh, in this uh, aspect. So. Uh, uh, hello, hello, uh, sir. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good, Shomajit. How are you? And thanks for having me in this platform. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure is all ours, sir. Uh, uh, so I'm doing great. Uh, so uh, I think we should uh, start the session with the ice-breaking question, you know. Uh, just on a lighter note that uh, uh, I have I've told that it has been a journey of 15 long years in the industry uh, with so many experiences in uh, so many uh, uh, groundbreaking companies. You know, and how has the journey been in all total? And when you relate this journey back to your undergraduate days, you know, 2002 to 2006 batch, you are also from uh, Jadapur University, you know, and the scenario has changed over the years uh, in the 2019, 2021 20, batch. Now, uh, they're not even going to the campuses to have the classes. They're having the classes online due to the situation. So how do you relate back when you see those days and now you see this kind of scenario? How has it changed? And what do you connect with the anecdotes and the memories from that journey? And how has it helped throughout that, that phase? Yeah, that's, that's actually a great starting question. So, and uh, really, I, when I look at the current scenario of the pandemic, I'm quite baffled that how engineering students are actually managing remotely without going to campus. And like the JU days, the campus was a very big part of uh, our entire daily routine i think it was same for you guys also uh, especially i was involved in a lot of extracurriculars like photography music also i used to be the class representative so like staying eight ten hours in campus was like a daily routine so yeah it's it's a bit sad i think and not only sad it's very challenging for technology students like without going to the lab and things that they are managing the internet helps a lot uh, which in our days was just kicking in so there was a lot of like reading and referring to physical books which uh, has got replaced with a lot of online references and lot online resources which has helped in this situation but it, what I feel talking to freshers is that the way we tackled academics and how they are tackling now, it's very, very different. Uh, it was more individualistic at that point of time because cell phones have just kicked in. If we have to discuss something out of college, we would to call people's landline and talk something. Now the group study part has gotten more because it's very easy to connect to people. So it's, I, I think it's very different. I, I just wonder how I would have tried that at this point of time. So it, it, it is a very different experience, but all in all, I think you just need to get the best knowledge that you can in these four years. That bottom line remains the same, I think. That is what I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And the days have always changed and it was a different experience altogether and every experience is to be had. Right. So, so absolutely understanding that. Uh, so uh, on a different note, sir, like I would like to ask that he, uh, since we have talked about your industry experience, uh, you know, from 2006 to 2013, uh, seven years of enriched experience and then you uh, decided to move to PhD, you know, and then you completed a P your PhD from IIT Delhi. 
so I would like to ask why this decision of uh, staying in the industry and going for a PhD and uh, on a follow up note, uh, how does a PhD or a higher qualification actually can help the students in the industry because uh, generally there is a perspective that when someone goes for a PhD or a master's, you know, uh, people tend to think that they are going in the uh, profession of teaching or they are going for a postdoctoral research. But uh, very few people actually realize that there is a scope of higher studies uh, getting reflected in the industries as well, uh, particularly pertaining to the Indian market. How, how do you think the higher studies will be helpful and why was your decision after uh, so many years of work experience, you know, uh, to, to go for a PhD degree? Yeah, again, again, really, really great question, Shomadit. So it, uh, it, it can't be said uh, very short uh, in a, it's not a short answer, but I would just elaborate it to make things clear. The perspective, at least when our generation passed uh, engineering, there were a lot, lot who were like first time engineers in their uh, uh, family. It was the same with me, like my parents, uh, they were into education and they were to like uh, common sciences uh, like that. And engineering, you really, when you get into it, it's not covered in your plus two level. So you really don't know what you are studying. And then because we didn't have much online resources connecting to seniors and getting advice, then that was difficult at that point of time. So it's like uh, some teachers who guide you and then it's your own perspective. And when you join engineering, you never really know that whether you will like the subject or not. That is a huge gamble because when you enter, you really have no idea what you are going to be taught. And uh, luckily after uh, my second year or third year, I figured out that I like this subject and then I wanted to stick to that line. And then when I got a job in Indian oil, I thought that, yeah, this is like a nice place because it's a oil refining field, which is vast and uses many principles of chemical engineering. So I joined the job and then I shifted to Linde, which is also a giant in industrial gases. But then after the five, six years, it become, became clear to me that I want to stay in this field. And I want to do things like more of a development type of work and such things. And when I started looking into job scopes in that area, I figured out that the masters and PhD degree holders obviously have a very, very definitive edge. If you want to go for industrial R&D and technology development and sort like that. So that was one of my main motivation and a little uh, side motivation, which you can see is when you do a PhD, the, the scope increases to a lot of other fields where I have some in this like as you all he said that it opens up an interest, it opens up an area in academics and the world is very fast changing and people's interests are also changing. Fast gone are the days where people will just stick to an organization for 35 years. So maybe I just want to do teaching five, 10 years down the line. So that, uh, that aspect opens up in senior leadership roles, especially in technical field. You would see a, in a lot of places, PhD is considered as good as a replacement for MBA. So degree-wise, that also gives you an edge. So all these were my motivation for pursuing the PhD. And I actually did it on a part-time basis. So I didn't leave my job while doing it. Staying in Delhi definitely helped. And my company was also pretty supportive about that. But it's very hectic. I, I must say that the caveat is that it is very, very hectic to handle a full-time job with a part-time PhD. So if anybody is planning to do that, please, please uh, be sure that three to four years, your other things will just take a big backseat.
coming to the next part of your question yeah there are a lot of industrial r and d opportunities but still at the moment when you look at that india is still a little behind in that the industrial r and d's are mostly still concentrated in the developed economies but india is catching up like our india office also has a very small r and d group where i worked before i shifted recently to our us office with a different role and similar roles are available in different mncs as well as the r and d's of different public sector undertaking so there are opportunities and opportunities are increasing but uh, still india um, uh, means has to cover quite a few miles if it wants to be at par with the us industrial or the european industrial r and d scenario yeah yeah totally totally agreed you know uh, the perspective that you gave and the details of the journey that has been there so that was quite uh, enriching and and it was a great thing to hear Uh, i would uh, surely vouch that the students would also get the benefit and so my uh, next question is uh, about this uh, competitive job market you know many students have been asking that it's such a competitive job market out there and switching is also an issue you know even if you get into a sector and then try to switch in another sector it's very difficult to survive and switch and uh, you know get an opportunity and get a breakthrough and penetrate into this competitive job market so uh, if some wants to secure a job uh, what are the steps that uh, or or the preparation that uh, one has to follow holistically and will the winter internships uh, summer internships trainings projects as a whole enrich this uh, uh, journey uh, will it uh, be that helpful for the students to bag a job and if so uh, how how good will it be okay i would uh, first answer the second part of your question about the internship because that basically builds up to the job thing as per my opinion internships are actually very very important they are very underrated still in indian colleges and universities but they are very important and i strongly recommend students to look for internships from the very end of their second year uh, as per the modern curriculum once you finish the second year you have got a little inkling about the core subjects so just go for internships and uh, even if students are very sure which is rarely the case that which line they want to pursue that whether they want to go to sales or marketing or some technical jobs or want to go to academics after uh, finishing their undergrad even if they are very sure i would suggest still do different type of internships like don't stick to just going to research organizations or don't just try to go to industries or operating companies is as far as chemical engineering is concerned try to do different type of internships because that gives you an idea about how different systems work and at a job level you just you might be a technocrat but you need to maybe uh, collaborate with some universities for some developmental issues so uh, getting that idea and doing internships is very important to give you a feel of what is out there actually in the market and that definitely helps you in the decision making of what type of job you want to do or whether you directly want to pursue some higher studies after you finish your undergrad so internships are a very integral part of the course that is what i would say regarding preparation for the job there are two aspects one is applying for a job as a fresher and then applying with a junior level of experience i would say 3 to 5 years i am not going beyond that because then a lot of things changes people's family responsibilities kick in sometimes the decision making process is not just related to professional goals there are a lot of personal goals involved in that 
but for a fresher and for people up to three to five years of experience, it's mostly the same. I just want to do work in a reputed company, do some work that I enjoy and get paid well. That is more or less where you can summarize the requirements. And as a fresher, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, firstly, keep your grades to a decent level. You don't need to be like a topper or within the top five, but keep your grades up so that when the uh, interviewer looks at it, because you have very little to show rather than your academics. And if uh, the interviewer sees a low CGPA, obviously it creates a negative biasness. So clear that out. Remember that mostly like a cutoff that you need to remain above a certain level, maybe within the top 20 or something, top 50% or 40% or something like that. As per the latest trend, your CGPA should look decent. Internships, uh, they can help you to build connections, which can help you to get a job in the same company. So maintain contacts. Now we have this great platform, different professional networking sites, the best being LinkedIn. So get connected to seniors, to areas where you like to work, get in touch with professionals there, try to build a network that will help you in off-campus selections. Because uh, like if I know somebody's name, it gives a little bit of mileage. When, when you drop the CV in. And then obviously go to an interview with your basics clear. If you are uh, giving an interview after three to five years of experience, then have a sound knowledge of the technology you have worked with, because that is what will be tested. And, uh, but for the freshers, just go with the basic equations and stuff like that. Uh, basic understanding, don't uh, mug up equations, they don't help. The basic understanding, the concept behind the equations, that is what will help. And then go with a positive mindset. And one thing I tell everybody that if you don't know anything, it's okay, you are not supposed to give 100% correct. So just say straight away that you don't know. Or if you are guessing, be very candid about it that I'm not exactly sure this is my educated guess. Because an interviewer always likes to get somebody who knows what he doesn't know rather than who doesn't know what he doesn't know. That is a very dangerous thing. So, so be very clear about that. That would be my tips about that in an interview. Yeah, uh, very elaborated and very detailed answer will surely help the students a lot. Uh, you know, uh, absolutely, as, as correctly mentioned, you know, with a positive mindset and accepting the fact that you don't know is very important. Uh, so I will uh, delve a little bit more, you know, I will try to be a mo little more specific on your experience since you have been associated with the crude oil industry, this refining hydro processing industry for quite a long time now. You know, many people are actually interested in the crude oil industry a lot and uh, in the current curriculum structure that we have in most of the colleges uh, you know in btech uh, a general perspective of chemical engineering is given and you know uh, crude oil is just a subsection of one of the subjects maybe chemical technology they teach and and some dedicated classes are given to that but often people feel and i too feel that there are so many units in the industry that has to be taught individually and dealt individually that can be the uh, separate lecture on an ADU, on a VDU, on the hydro processing unit, you know, on the hydro desulfurization unit. Each individual unit can be talked of separately in a single class and there has to be an entire subject, you know, in the curriculum that can actually drive this. But unfortunately, it is only a part or a sub subject of a main subject. So students who derive interest or are, are much motivated to it, what, as an industry expert, what would you suggest uh, as the material or the go-to solution for this kind of students in their bachelors uh, who can learn about the crude oil industry uh, inside out through some uh, materials or through some books maybe that you suggest or through some video lectures in that sense? And how are they going to prepare uh, for a job interview in typical in this particular domain? Uh, what should be the plan of action there? 
Yeah, very pertinent question, Shomujit. And yeah, this is a problem because the curriculum is very, very intense and it's really difficult to cover like uh, even the major units that uh, oil refining has with that short curriculum. So uh, if a student, firstly, I must say that if a fresher is setting up an interview, it is quite unlikely that they would be grilled with a lot of details of like each unit because the interviewer also knows that they are not supposed to know these things. Very basic thing like a simple flow or scheme of a refinery, like a video comes after a EDU or a coker unit comes after that. Like what, when you will uh, prefer between a FCCU or a hydrocracker. So very simple things like which are conceptual, which doesn't deal with things like at what pressure you operate, what temperature you operate or stuff like that. Those are a bit unlikely to come in a freshers interview, but they should get a feel of how a refinery is set up depending on what are your, its feeds and what are its end products. So that is the first thing. But still, if a student wants to delve into more details, there is nothing barring them. There are a lot of good books, petroleum handbooks, one that I follow sometimes and uh, which is quite good, which I can uh, remember at the back of mind. There is one by a guy called Robert Ness, uh, something called the petroleum handbook. Then there are very good uh, detailed uh, petroleum books uh, re published by IFP, which is commonly known as Accents to a lot of people. So IFP has a series of five books with uh, different processes, start from crude oil characterization to conversion processes and things like that. So these are, uh, these are good resources. Springer has a very good handbook on uh, petroleum refining, co-authored by one of my present colleagues called Paul Robinson. So that can also be looked into. So these are like a few good books with some the refers. I think they will get a very good idea about, about the refining process. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The books and materials will surely uh, help as you have referred to. Uh, now I would like to shift a little, like we have been asking about interviews, these questions. We will come back to this uh, sometime later, but what I now I'd like to uh, ask you is somewhat that personally, some question that personally intrigues me as well. Since you have been in the space of, you know, uh, fossil fuels, uh, crude oil, and, and also working uh, tits bits in the uh, renewable en energy domain, you know, it's been said that the fossil fuels are here to stay for the next 50 years only. And then they are going to be replaced by uh, green fuels. They are going to be replaced by renewable sources of energy. And uh, people are moving towards a more sustainable and greener uh, alternative. So uh, as an industry expert, since you have seen this so closely, uh, what do you think? Are the fossil fuels here to stay just for 50 years? Or uh, it would take uh, more than a century to actually uh, completely transform the Indian and the world uh, fraternity into a greener uh, alternative, better alternative. What do you think? Well, to start with uh, Shomujit, I will share a small incident or a small experience with it, uh, you. So when I joined the Indian Oil, I first attended like the um, uh, town hall where uh, they shared the yearly financial details. So that was, I think, in the end 2006 or early 2007. And there are always these projections about uh, the crude reserves and things like that. And then there was a projection about crude oil reserves, which said like 40 years. Now it's 2021, we see the same uh, projections and it's still 40 years. So, <laughs> So the thing is, as far as crude oil and fossil reserves are concerned, it is very, very difficult to predict because the tools are not so sophisticated, which can map the entire world as that, okay, this much we have. Nobody knows how much we have. 
So that is as far as finishing the reserves are concerned. So we are not sure how much we have. We can't really say when we will finish it. Secondly, about replacing fossil fuel with greener sources. Yeah, there is a lot of work that is going on. And uh, we see that there are significant development in this field. I am working with mostly renewable diesel and renewable jet fuel for the last three, three and a half years. And then there are solar, wind, and battery materials, and all of these are coming. But if you still look at the world's energy consumption and the percentage that these so-called renewable sources are contributing to, they are still very, very less. And changing them uh, or replacing the fossil uh, energy with this, it is, I would not say it's impossible, but it's a Herculean task because there are energy density issues, there are infrastructure issues, there are a lot of other issues that uh, comes in, uh, which uh, a lot of people are just now doing in a go. And we have started to hear this word greenwashing, that you are just telling people that things will be green where practically it is not feasible. So I, am, I would say that I am cautiously skeptic about this. And even, this happen, even if this happens, that we largely replace fossil fuels, it, it needs to be a very, uh, it, it will happen in slow steps. It, nothing will happen overnight. The transition will be slow because the energy policies, the infrastructure, the money, et cetera, everything needs to come in together to make it work. And that, that is not going to happen overnight. That is my take on it, but this field is so complicated and it is politically driven, it is geopolitically driven and uh, profit driven. So I might say a completely different thing one year down the line. But at the moment, this is what my understanding says. Yes, yes, absolutely understood your perspective of the same and you have already covered the uh, renewable projects that are there in place and the things that you have been working on. So uh, uh, the, the, the topic now coming back to the interest of the audience, you know, uh, something that intrigues the people, you know, uh, working in the industry, some something called the work-life balance and the work culture in the industry. Since you have been associated with so many great organizations, you know, uh, some that some exemplary of organizations like uh, IOCL, Linde, uh, Alda Top. So, you know, these are the dream companies of many. And uh, when you have worked so many years in the last 15 years, what has been, what is, what is your take on the work, working culture at these companies and the work-life balance as a whole when someone is into this industry uh, domain of uh, being a process engineer or in the manufacturing or in the designing sector? Uh, how do you think is the work-life balance that's, that's there in place? Well, uh, industry-wise, the first thing that I would say is uh, the work hours are not so intense compared to some other fields which I hear of, like the uh, data analytics people or maybe the hedge fund people. And they, I, I hear they work for 12, 14, 16 hours sometimes or same in the consulting, core consulting team. So my, my first thing that I would say is that it's not so long work hours. Usually we don't see. There might be anomalies, but usually see it. By and large, all these years that I have worked, except cases of emergencies and that can happen, like an emergency can happen once in a three or four months for maybe a period of five days. Uh, I have tried to work not more than eight to nine hours a day on an average. And uh, weekends are weekends, they are leaves for me. So except when I'm at site for some site work, then obviously the weekend concept doesn't work. 
you usually get one day off and then six days are working and then the work hours are also a bit long in uh, and that is not in operations this i'm talking about commissioning or startups where the work hours are usually 12 hours six days a week but uh, as far as office hours have, uh, goes i've worked like on an average i would say i've not worked eight to nine a day for all these years now as far as work life balance uh, is concerned uh, i would say it depends upon three things first is the organization's work life balance as a whole secondly is the work life balance in your team and thirdly it is the work life balance you want to maintain individually if an organization overall has a bad work life balance they don't value it then it's very difficult to create that work life balance then if an organization overall has a good work life balance there can be still pockets like groups which like work crazy because their boss demands more or their be like they are handling some crazy timelines or some like that so that can be a pocket and if you fall into that pocket and you value your work life balance then it might be a good option to try to go to other groups in the same organization and lastly it depends a lot on yourself like how much fast paced your career you want how much you want to prove yourself as an overachiever to your boss for the want of promotions and a little bit of more salary increment and things like that that is very very individualistic and people have to decide that what they are willing to trade for a higher position and higher salary for me it has been very important to maintain a work life balance so that is what has been my priority and i have been able to maintain a good work life balance till date and the other thing related to this is i would say if you want a good work life balance you should have the ability to say no to your peers or your boss thing if something some deadline some demand is unreal stick you have to be very upfront and say that no this is not possible or i cannot do it with in this this time frame that is very very important to do that yeah yes absolutely it's a, it's a skill to you know there is a book called the uh, subtle art of saying no so that exactly is, that, that is something that the people should read um, so lastly sir i would like to uh, conclude by asking this one question you know uh, pertaining to the industries that are there how are people going to search for career opportunities in this particular uh, companies uh, like take the example of hella uh, top so you have been working with hella top so for the last 8 uh, 8 uh, to 9 years you know and uh, if somebody uh, wants to search for a career uh, opportunity there how are they supposed to do that because people generally have this query when while they are switching or while they are looking for off campus opportunities and if they at all find the career uh, options there and they apply and they end up having an interview call uh, you know uh, what are the chances of converting and what are the skills this interviewers generally look out for in this candidates while they select them yeah that's a, that's a very good question shomudit and so there are two parts of your question one is applying as a fresher to off campus and then trying to switch when already somebody is working uh firstly as far as halder topso is concerned uh, the number of freshers we take are still quite less because of the nature of the job demands a little bit of prior experience in the field of operations and allied field uh, but it's not that we don't take at all the, but the percentage is less the way of applying i would say is to keep an eye on our linkedin page because the advertisements usually come up there then obviously through the linkedin peer network if you already know somebody in as your senior college senior or university senior who works there so reaching out to them is a great idea i get pretty regularly interest from people who are now in college that 
they want to join what is the way so that is a great idea and this not only is for halder talk so this is for any mnc in general uh, that you can do and uh, the similar things also apply for somebody who is working and wants to shift so keep an eye on the linkedin page update your cv in the different job portals get in touch with recruiters and try to connect your seniors who are or anybody you have met professionally also in some meetings or con says just reach out that sir we meet here and i am interested for a position in your company in this role is there any opening so that is that is how you should go about it a uh, preparation for interview as i already said it's pretty straightforward stick to the basics if you are shifting from uh, a present job be thorough with the present technology or the present things you are working with go with a positive frame of mind be clear about what you know and what you don't know and the other things that a company usually tries to see nowadays is generally your basic communication skills both verbal and written because you need to write a lot of mails and stuffs in companies like us and you have to deal with a lot of stakeholders both internal and external and obviously the aspect that whether you can work in a team because we all need to work in a team so those are the basic things that a company looks for a uh, conversion rate uh, Uh, i would say that conversion rate shouldn't be bad just from the statistical point of view that a interview taking process is a very tedious process from a company's perspective so they don't want to interview 10 people and select one because the rest nine the time they have spent in the, the interview has just gone to the drain without giving the company anything so uh, as far as off campus selections are concerned if your cv gets shortlisted for an interview i would say that you have at least a 30% chance of getting converted if if your cv doesn't match the role then there is a very high chance that you will not be called for the interview so once you are getting called for an interview go with a positive mindset do the prep Chen and I think you have at least a thirty percent chance of getting it converted. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So it was a very nice experience talking to you. You know, with the industry experience that you possess, uh, you have really enlightened the people, and will this will definitely give the people a food for thought uh, in their upcoming days. You know, so it was lovely having you. Uh, having you sir on the on, on this platform uh, just any last minute tips that you would like to give to these young graduates that are around the corner and and trying to explore uh, much into the sectors uh, and are still not finding their way through but they are uh, really looking for a way forward so any last minute tips that you would like to give yeah so i would say that these are tough times especially because of this pandemic uh, just the thing is that be patient patience is a great word too and try hitting the things whether you are trying to get into a good college for a higher degree or are trying to get into a good company just don't lose your focus and try hitting and definitely sooner or later you will achieve what what you want to achieve yeah surely surely so thank you once again sir for uh, giving your uh, valuable time uh, to this uh, show thank you very much for coming in uh, with one request so thank you once again and thank you so much thank you thank you very much sir and with that we come to the end of uh, this episode of experience matters and we are here to uh, bring more industry experts uh, from different domains and and help the students as much as we can uh, if you like our work like it share it with your friends subscribe to our channel that's it for today thank you very much thank you once again rajesh sir thank you thank you